texting, no more phone calls. Are you listening? But, we were talking about but before, right? But, God says, cut the line and cut the cord now. Not only separate yourselves from your neighbors, but separate yourselves from your pagan wives, not from your wives. I don't want, now I don't want everyone to go out and fight for a divorce tomorrow just because you're having a disagreement or fighting or whatever. That's not, that's not God. Are you listening out there? Because I know some women are, some people are dying for that. But it says here, do not separate yourselves from your, uh, separate yourselves from your pagan wives. You trying to tell me that God is saying to divorce them? No, he's not telling them to divorce them. See, this marriage was never sanctified in the eyes of God. Right? So in the eyes of God, that marriage never existed. Are you listening? The justice of the peace may say it existed. Many of the clergy might say it existed. But in the eyes of God, God says, I don't recognize your marriage. Because I told you in the beginning to stay away from these people. And not only not to stay away from these people, don't intermingle with them. But God, we got married. No, you did not. I do not recognize your marriage, God says. I do not recognize your union. Are you listening out there, gays and homosexuals and lesbians? I don't recognize your union. I don't recognize what you say. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what the Pope says. Are you listening? I don't care what the convention says. Amen. We all should be standing up. I don't care what anyone else says. God says. He is God. He has the last word. He is the creator of all things. And God says, I don't recognize your marriage. And it sucks. Woo! Pastor, are you trying to tell me there are marriages out there that are not recognized by God? Yes. Yes. And God says to what? Separate yourself from them. Not only wives and husbands, but friends, acquaintances. If they're not godly, and if they're not part of God's plan for your life, and if God says they're not for you, what are you going to do? You're going to do what God says, or you're going to suffer? Because nothing good comes from disobeying God. Nothing ever is blessed outside of God's will. Are you listening? Nothing is ever, ever good without God's touch to it. So you can waste your time, you can go in circles, and you can rebel against God. But God will have the last say, and you have just wasted your life. Yep. <laughs> I can hear those people. What's the one word they were saying? But. But, but, but. Some people have big butts out there. That's all they say is but. That's all they know is but. God doesn't listen to buts. He listens only to his own son. He is God. He loves you. And he wants the best for you. God knows more than you do, folks. That's a shock to you, but God knows more than you. God, I know about, I know about expertise. I'm an IT teacher. No, you don't. You don't know nothing. God knows everything, and we know nothing. God knows what's ahead of us before we even see it. God knows what lies ahead of us before we even recognize it. God knows everything. He knows everything around us. There are things around us we have no idea what's going on, and we're sucker punched. God knows everything, folks. He knows everything. He knows what works and what's not going to work. He knows who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there. He knows what you should do and what you should not do. And if you're disobeying God right now, and if you're not fulfilling His word and law, that's why you're suffering. That's why you're tired. That's why you're sick. That's why you're bored. That's why you're depressed. If you do it God's way, I will guarantee you, you won't have none of those, okay? If you do it God's way, you will be blessed. 
But if you don't do it God's way, stay where you are and see what happens. See if it changes for you. All right, let's look at some of this here. Let's look at some of the worthiness here. We'll go to a few of these verses for a minute. Worldliness. Luke 21.34. In your notes, Luke 21.34, worldliness is a burden. You know how powerful this word is? You know people are healed by just reading the Bible? Did you know that? God says it is done. Look at Luke 21, 34. Worldliness is a burden. It's a weight. Burden means weight. Right? But take heed to yourselves, watch unto yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down, be burdened with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day will come on you unexpectedly. You remember the days of Noah? Listen, listen for all you pre-tribbers out there. You know this very well. How was it in the days of Noah before the flood came? Everybody was eating, drinking, marrying, carrying on, right? Mm -hmm. Until the door of that ark shut. Okay. okay? So everything is going to go on as normal until the day when Jesus comes back. And he will come back at a time when we least expect it. Mm -hmm. Okay? The sin of worldliness is this. It weighs you down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. The devil has given you so many options on this planet to keep you confused, dazed, to keep you from getting bored. But see, you're missing the big picture. You're missing God. Everything is taking so much of your life, you miss God. Amen? Yeah. And if you don't see God, you don't see blessing. And if you don't see blessing, you don't see truth. If you don't see truth, you don't see life. So what the devil does is to try to keep you in the shroud and this maze of, of the cares of this life. And every turn you go to turns to something of this world, right? But here's the interesting thing of it. You're wasting your time because you're not going to take it with you. Well, I need clothes to wear right now. Yeah, clothes, not Gucci or Gucci Gucci or whatever. I know people that only wear a certain kind of shoes and they have to cost, what, 50, 100, 200 dollars? We go to Walmart. We go to Goodwill. We don't have $70 million jets to fly in it. Hello. I don't wear three piece suits every Sunday. My undergarments have holes in them. Okay? But I'm still here. I'm alive. Amen? Still preaching the word? Tell you what, I'm gonna have a fan club. Here we go. Now it says here, James four four. You remember James four four? Let's read that again. Folks, we need to get serious about this because God is serious. Does God have a sense of humor? No. Hmm. He's serious. You think God will laugh at some of this stuff today? I think he's pretty sad. Yes. I think he's very hurt. And I think he's very concerned. James 4.4 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? In other words, that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God right away? Okay. Whosoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. When Israel did what they did with the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Amorites, the Egyptians, when they did what they did, they made themselves enemies of God. When you disobey God, you make him an enemy. Do you understand? When you disobey God, you make him an enemy. You don't want God as your enemy. You want God to be on your side. You don't want to get on his bad side. Because God will make sure See, God is not your mom and your dad. Are you listening? He's not your grandpa. He's not going to let you get away with stuff. 
He's not going to enable you. He's not going to make excuses for you. He's not going to pawn on you. God is just. God is fair. And God, he's love. But he's not a liberal. Okay, you know what I mean by that? He doesn't sweep everything into the rut and justify it. God will have the last word and he will teach you his ways. The word teach means that you have to live his ways. You have to live it out. And if you get stuck, God will let you get stuck. So you know, number one, what it's like to get stuck. And number two, how to get out of it. Parents, let your kids get stuck. Let them learn how to get out of it. Because you're not going to be around forever to get them out. Are you listening? They're going to have to learn to get out themselves. They're going to have to learn how to support themselves. They're going to have to learn to pray for themselves. They're going to have to learn to talk to God themselves. They're going to have to learn how to live for themselves. Yeah. You're not doing it. We went to graduation last night. My nephew graduated. Some get cars, some get money, some get cards, some get jewelry. Let me tell you what I got for my graduation. 1985, last Friday in May. I think it was May 24th. After I got my diploma and I said, yeah, I made it. And we all, everything, I said hi, I said goodbye to my friends. And as I was anticipating, we had a Santos party at home. If you've never been to a Santos party, it's unique, okay? Dad put me to the side. He made a great speech. Says, I'm proud of my son. He finally made it. Yada, yada, yada. I hope God blesses you. I hope God's with you. Yada, yada, yada. Right? So after we had our tamales and after we had our barbecue chicken and had our flan. Flan is awesome. He put me aside to his room. And I was excited. I thought, wow, I'm going to get that car. You know, he's going to give me the keys to a car. Or he's going to give me some money. I mean, I was thinking, what in the world is he going to give for me? I finally graduated. It's a big accomplishment. I know it's going to be something big, right? He saved that money. He did this for me, right? So I got to the bedroom. He said, son, I'm proud of you. I love you. You're a good man. Stay that way. Don't be stupid. That kind of speech. He says, I want to give you something. So he reached into his pocket and I was thinking, oh my God, this is it. Are you ready for this? It's keys to a car. It's money. Something big, right? He pulled out a quarter. This is true. He pulled out a quarter. I thought he was joking. I had a confused look. I said, um, a quarter? He says, this is for you. Have you ever gotten mad before? Because your expectations... He says, I want you to take this quarter. And I want you to go to the corner store. I want you to buy a newspaper. And I want you to start your life. And it starts with four words. Four letters. One word. What do you think that word was, Mr. Ed? Work. Get your butt up. Listen. He said, get your butt up starting Monday morning. And you go to work. Is that child abuse? Is that wrong? Is that insensitive? Is that uncaring? Is that wrong? Is it? Not only did I love him, but I respected him. Amen? He says, I'm raising a man, not a boy. 
The first car I got, I bought it. The first house that I got, I bought it. I worked for it. First credit cards I got, earned it with my credit when it was good. I earned it. I worked for that. It's not a sin, folks. Don't make it before God. And I think people are doing that right now. God's going to take that away. Okay? If you put work before you, God, God's going to take that work away. He's not going to let you get away with it. But, he doesn't want to hear buts. But mom, he doesn't care what your mom says or your dad says. He's God. He's the final authority. Folks, we need to do that more, amen? We need to do that a whole lot more because we have a generation of people that don't want to do that anymore. They glamorize sin. They make friends with people they should not have made friends with. They marry them and they mess up their lives and then they mess up their kids' lives. And then their kids repeat the same mistakes because no one taught them the right way to do it. And this is good. I like this. It says here, Let's go to let's go to two verses. Well, let's let's go to this one verse. Second Timothy chapter four verse ten. I'm going to show you a verse here that that a lot of people. It's in the Bible. I'm going to show you Second Timothy four ten. Does God allow Satan to get into your life sometimes? Does God allow the devil to get into your life for a reason, for a purpose? A lot of people say no because they don't think God would ever do that. There are times when God is going to allow the devil to prune you, to torture you for a reason. Okay? And I'm going to show you an example right here. It's in 2 Timothy 4.10. It's in the Bible. This is completely in the Word. Grab any version of your Bible. I don't care if it's the NIV version, the King James version, the David Jeremiah version, or any version of the Bible that you have. Are you listening? You Jehovah Witnesses, go to your Bible too, and it will say the same thing. There was this one lady. It was awesome, Mister. I went to her about the Bible, about the end times, and I used her Bible. I did not go and get my special Mark Bible. I used her Bible, and I showed her where it says in God's Word. It was awesome. She never came back. Scared, scared her silly. But it says here in Second Timothy four ten. <laughs> It's in the Bible. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Christians for Galatia, Titus from the Dalmatia. Huh. De uh, Demas was a half Christian. He only served God part time. This was not full time status. Part-time jobs give you part-time benefits, right? Part or none. And see, Demas left Paul, left, and Timothy wrote about this, because he loved this world and he forsaken everything. Demas was disciplined by God through Satan. Demas lost his job. Demas lost his family, and Josephus, the Jewish historian, said about Demas that God gave him everything and God took away everything. Why? Why is God so mean? He's not mean, folks. He's fair. If you love God, then obey. Amen? If you love God, serve Him. If you love God, listen to Him. What's the, let me see this next one. It says it one more. It says here, uh, Second King, Second King, seventeen fifteen. We'll end with this. I hope you've been blessed today, and I hope God's word has helped you. Because that's the whole reason that we do this is for your benefit. Because 
there's going to come a time when you won't see us anymore because the rapture will have happened. And when the rapture happens, folks, I'm gone. Okay? And I hope my family's with me. I hope they are. I can't answer for them, but they better be if they know what's good for them. And not only that, I plan on it. I don't, I mean, No, yeah, you don't have to worry. So there's going to come a time when we'll be gone because God took us home. Second Corinthians, I mean, Second Kings seven, Second Kings seventeen fifteen. Ready for this? Here we go. We're going to end with this. The nation of Israel has rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them, and they followed idols. Listen to this. They followed idols. They became idolaters. They went after the nations who were around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they would they should do not like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, and they made for themselves a molded image and two calves, and made a wooden image and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, practicing witchcraft, demonic seances. And they sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked them to anger. Therefore the Lord God was very angry with the nation of Israel, and listen to this, and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah. What does that mean when it says God removed them from his sight? Did he close his eyes? Did he turn the other way? I studied this. God literally wiped them from the face of the earth. We're going to end with this as we pray. Let's go as far as in prayer. Are you in love? Boy, that was random. No, listen, listen carefully. Are you in love? One of the most hurtful things about love is that it's not reciprocated. You don't feel the same way about you. And that hurts. It's painful. They love you, but not the way they should. Maybe not fully, not, not 100%. Not the way you think they should love you. That's painful. But with imperfect people, that's to be expected, right? Are you perfect? No. Is there anyone perfect around you? No. So why do you expect perfection out of imperfection? Right? Okay. If you want to guarantee, if you want perfect perfection, bow your heads right now. If you are sincere about this and say, Lord, I need someone in my life I can count on, I can depend on, that is reliable. I need someone that is always there, someone that will love me, someone that will help me, someone that will bless me, someone that is for me and not against me. Lord, I can't find anyone where well, you're not going to find anyone here. Are you listening? You want perfection. You want a guarantee. You're not going to find it on this planet. You're not going to find it in Mexico. You're not going to find it in England or Tahiti or Canada or Africa. You're not going to find it anywhere. Because the one that you seek is not of this world. He is above us. He is sitting at the right hand of God and He is God. And here's the thing about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. When you repent of your sins, and get your life right with Him, He's going to love you with a love that no one else can ever surpass. Are you listening? Jesus Christ will give you such a love, and such affection, and such kindness, and such compassion, that no one else can even touch it. The only love that you're going to want from this is from the love of God. Amen? That's the only love that's going to satisfy you. That's the only love that's going to keep you going. That's the only love that will, that will fulfill you. That is the only love that will not let you down. 
That is the only love that is reliable and dependable. That is the only love that is there. That is the only love that is perfect. That is the only love that comes with a guarantee. If you want that in your life, and if you need that in your life, bow your heads right now. Because the only love that can be offered and that is there and that is real is Jesus Christ. How much does He love you? He died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross for every sin of your life. He died on the cross and shed every drop of His blood from His veins, from head to toe, because He loves you. Amen. He loves you that much. He loves you more than you will ever understand. He loves you more than you could ever fathom. He wants the best for you. He wants perfection for your life. He wants to forgive you. He wants to love you. He wants to sustain you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to comfort you. Is that what you need in your life? Is that what you need right now? Then bow your heads. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, please forgive us for our sins. We repent of our sins. We have sinned against you. We should be ripping our clothes and pulling the hair from our bodies and, because it, it is a big deal. Sin is a big deal. It separates us from you. It separates us from your love and your forgiveness. That's why we repent of this sin. That's why we're, we're choosing you over sin. Amen? We're choosing Christ over our sins. We're choosing His blood over this world. We're choosing you. That's what repentance means. That means that we're choosing you. And not only are we choosing you, we want to serve you. We want you in our life. Not in our life, but to be our life. Everything revolves around you now. You are the center of our life. You're the throne in our heart. You're the throne in our soul and our spirit. You are the last word in our life. And Lord, those people that don't take you serious, discipline them, spank them, get their attention somehow, Lord, because this is serious. For there will come a day, Lord, when you will come back and you will take us home. Amen? But those that did not serve you and love you and repented and come to you, they're going to be left behind. They're left behind for good. And they're going to suffer the most horrific tribulation that the world will ever see. And it's close, Lord. The time is short to get your word out. The time is short to get the truth out. Every soul counts. Leave no soul behind. That's our motto. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Save those souls that turn to you. Bless them, protect them, but most of all, love them in Christ's name.